Well, good morning, everybody. It is, uh, it is a joy to be with you this morning, and whether, uh, whether you're here in the building or whether you're joining us online, so appreciate you being here. Uh, we finished uh, an entire month looking at mission and vision statements of the church, and the reason that we exist as a church, our, our mission is actually to express the unconditional love of Jesus to everyone. When we think about the unconditional love of Jesus, we get this feeling that we know quite a lot about that. But as we actually open up the scripture and as we read, uh, we find that the scripture unnerves us. It shakes us as we look into the life of Jesus specifically. We find that it unsettles our preconceived ideas. And so uh, as we open up to, for example, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, as it's rendered in the, in the message translation, it goes something like this. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Just like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. That is startling. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Isn't that? Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love wasn't cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Love like that. Well, that is actually the name of a, a book we're closely following in the next five weeks, and we are asking everyone to find themselves in a small group as we uh, look at how Christ loves us and in turn how we then are to love like that. If you're not in a small group and you, you, you would love to be, at least for this five, five six weeks, uh, contact any of the pastors, groups at ercf.ca, or if you like, every Tuesday night here at the church at 7.30, there's a group that's going to be studying it. You can, you can jump uh, off at that point. But we would love you to get together. Here's the reason. What we say around here is that circles are better than rows. Uh, I love it that we're here. I love it we're, we're in rows. I, I love that I can share God's word with you. But it basically is one directional. When you're in a small group with people that are interacting and talking and you're sharing, your opinion matters, your view matters, how, how God speaks to you as you share that with other people, what God's doing in your heart, questions you have that you want to, to raise or things that you want to push back on. Other people benefit from it, and that's how we can grow better. So just want to encourage you. Uh, for example, in, in this last week, we started... This, uh, this series, and the, f the first part we're looking at is mindfulness, being mindful, being aware, because the reality is we have this amazing capacity to miss things that are right in front of us. One of the people in our group was mentioning a great application for this idea of being mindful is listening to people. I hadn't actually thought about that. It's kind of a an easy one in one sense, but it hadn't, it hadn't struck me before. To be mindful of what God wants to do in the lives of people and, and where God is moving, to be aware of it, it can start in conversation where we're listening. Because I, I, I love to talk, and, and maybe you're, you're the same. And what happens so easily is that I have a particular agenda, not a bad one, it's a good one. We all have good agendas, right? But Consequently, I've got something I want to say. I want to respond. I want to answer. And instead, uh, Jesus wants me to listen. Because to listen is to understand other people and to lay down my agenda. Mindfulness, being mindful is one way we can learn to love like that. 
for little kids, uh, we bring games and we bring books about that. I brought a few of my favorites along. Uh, I Spy, classic favorite. Uh, basically, we open it up and there's all kinds of pictures and there's something right in front of us and we're trying to find it and we want to be aware of stuff. Uh, then next we've got Where's Waldo? Yes, where's Waldo? And so again, you open it up, uh, all sorts of images, and you're looking for this one thing. It is there, and you may spend a long time looking for it until you see it, and then the thought is, how, how did I ever miss it? Well, my personal favorite is uh, dot stereographs, better known as hallusion art. It's a, a mix of holograms and illusions, and you stare at it, and there's a trick. And all of a sudden, from this page, drops out an image. It just sort of appears before your eyes. I could teach you how to do this. There, there is a trick to it. And then it appears in front of you. It was always there. And now you see it. Hopefully you do. Some of you have looked at these for hours, and you still don't see anything. Here's the deal, to be able to see what no one else sees. As I said, there, there is a trick to it. I could teach you how to do it. There's no trick to seeing things in front of us that we normally would miss. And what we need is we need the Holy Spirit to prompt us. And to love like Jesus means we have to drop our agenda. My agenda forces me to be busy and to do things and to be productive, and I've got things I want to do, and it's not bad. It's, it's good. It's fine. It's productive. We, that's, that's the name of the game in our society. And consequently, as we focus, we miss things that are right in front of us going on all around us. Uh, this, this week mentioned about our small group. In our small group, we, we looked at a video. It's referenced in this, this book, uh, Love Like That by Les Perot. And uh, you can look out of, on YouTube. Maybe not now. Maybe not now. Uh, so look up uh, The Dancing Bear or The Moonwalking Gorilla. Uh, cute little clips. And without giving it away, when you focus on something, you miss some incredible things going on in the background. And then afterwards you say, did you, did you see that thing going on in the background? No, you must have been lying. And then you repeat it again. And so what happens is our ability to focus, which is a gift of God, our ability to focus, our, our, the agenda that we bring to our life, focusing on all sorts of things. And if we're not sensitive to the Spirit of God, and if we are not aware that God is going to interrupt our life, then we will miss what is happening right in front of our eyes, seeing what others don't see. I'd like to read a story from John chapter 4 uh, to you, and I'm jumping in at uh, verse number 4, John 4, verses 4 to 10. It's the story of Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman. Okay, So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came to Sychar a Samaritan village that bordered the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well, and it was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy some food for lunch, and they weren't there, obviously. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would be giving you living water. Well, the, the reason I'm bringing up that story is not just for the contents 
of what Jesus is saying, which, which is amazing, and for another day, I'm bringing up the fact that in six verses, six times it mentions Samaria, Samaritan, Samaritan woman, Samaria, six different times. And the reason is because there, there's, a, there's a background that Jesus and his disciples are living in and walking in from the background into the present culture that they are in. So Jesus not only dropped his agenda and was open for people, he was willing to walk into a social landmine. He was totally willing to throw aside propriety and the social constructs of what is normal and acceptable and good and he is willing just to step right in to the mess because of the love that he has for people. 700 years before this incident, 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire overran the northern part of what we now see as Canaan, or they were called at that time the, the 12 northern tribes. Together they referred to as Israel. And the Assyrians overran these 10 northern tribes, Israel. And consequently, over the years, the Assyrian influence polluted the Jewish culture in the eyes of the Jews. And so there was Assyrian influence in, in the language, specifically in the religion. So it was a corruption of Judaism. So by the time Jesus comes, uh, you know, just over 700 years later, that part of Israel, Samaria, was looked on as half-breeds, corrupted Jews. They, they weren't real Jews. And so there was, this, there was this hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. In fact, the Jews, if they could, would avoid going into Samaria at all. And so here's Jesus decides to go into Samaria and of all things speak to a Samaritan woman. He's dropping his agenda and he's going to the person that God puts right in front of him. Now, this story is actually a a background for the next one I'd like to read from Luke chapter 10. So with, with this bit of a, of a history lesson, knowing how the Samaritans were viewed by, by the rest of the, the, the country and all the Jews, how they were hated and looked as half-breeds, and, and there, there was this animosity that was always fuming and ready to explode into the surface. So we take up the story in Luke chapter 10. It's one of Jesus' most well-known and, and, and most loved parables, the parable of the good Samaritan. Now, if for a moment, given the background, if we put ourselves into the minds of the people that are there, if we can somehow understand what they are feeling, it changes the tone and the color of everything that Jesus is saying. Being mindful is being aware of what is happening. And regardless of the personal feelings that, that may prop up, because here's the truth. The truth is sometimes we, we don't want to be aware because we just aren't enjoying the circumstance. We don't want to get involved because we don't like what we're going to have to get involved with. Someone asked Jesus after Jesus was teaching, how would you define my neighbor? And, and again, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Jesus answered by telling a story. There once was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, they beat him up, and he went off, they went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest came by. Now again, for the Jewish populace. This is one of the holy men, one of the religious leaders of the day. Jesus actually did start off the sentence by saying, luckily, so, okay, sigh of relief. They know that it's going to end up good. Was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. So 
being mindful is you see something, but what if you actually don't want to see it? What, what, what if somehow it's a circumstance, maybe it's a person you don't like or a group, group of people that you're offended against much like the Levite was? Or, sorry, the, the priest was? He angled away, walked to the other side of the road? Being mindful is not just being aware, but even if it's to your own personal detriment, you have an agenda, you're busy, you're on your way. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a a Levite, a religious man. So a Levite wasn't a a leader necessarily, it wasn't a priest, but they were from a very special family. Uh, They were well-esteemed. So they were great people, kind of leader pillars in the community. A Levite, a religious man, showed up, and he also avoided the injured man. Now, in some other translations, you you definitely get the feeling that it was the the busyness of life that made them push forward. And they they saw something, but they didn't want to respond, and they kept on going. Jesus says, a Samaritan traveling down the road came on him. Now, I just, I just wonder what everybody's thinking. I'm just wondering if the Jews are thinking, that's the guy that probably beat him up. It's a Samaritan. I bet you it is. It's the Samaritan that beat the guy up. I'm sure it was. So Jesus, a Samaritan comes, and he sees him. And when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. And again, right at this point, what, what's flashing? What is firing into the, from the minds of, of the Jews as they're listening? Are they thinking, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't tell me. He's not going to make the Samaritan the hero of this story. It can't be. No, no, Jesus, no. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, made him comfortable. And in the morning took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. Now we'll stop there. There's a little bit more to the story. And again, we're sort of skirting the the main idea of the story. Jesus telling us who our neighbor is. But coming back to this idea of being aware and being mindful, Jesus is dropping his agenda in order to love people. Again, going back for a moment to the Ephesians chapter 5, watch what God does, and then you do it. Just like children learn proper behavior by imitating their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep keep company, keep close company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved. It wasn't cautious, but extravagant. As I read that, I thought, are there times when I don't want to really extravagantly love a person because I don't want them to get the wrong idea. I I don't want to encourage them in in, in their bad behavior. So I've got to be, be really, really careful. I, I don't want to enable them. But Jesus isn't talking about that. He's talking about the heart and how easy it is to love people with reservation. And Jesus loved people extravagantly. And more powerfully, I think, he didn't love in order to get something us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. So we ask the question, what, what is the biggest thing from stopping us of being aware of people, of being mindful? They're, they're, they're right in front of us and we don't see it. So often it's our pursuit of our own personal agenda. We're just so busy and we don't see and, and I hate interruptions. Carrie and I have this ongoing conversation, like basically all the time, and it's about how we have a hard time with interruptions. It's, 
Carrie's got her agenda, I've got mine, and so things happen, and oh, okay, we, yes, we should do this, this is, you know, definitely we should do this, but it's, it's, it's still hard. Why is that? When you look at the, the life and the ministry and the miracles of Jesus, we find that many, many of his miracles are interruptions. Many of Jesus' miracles are interruption. Mark chapter 2, he's in a house. I think it's Peter's house. He's in Peter's house, and he's preaching and giving a sermon. And all of a sudden, these four crazy men are taking the roof apart, and dust is falling from the ceiling. Shafts of light are shining through. Everyone looks up, and these four crazy guys lower their friend on a pallet because he's paralyzed, and Jesus, Jesus heals him. Okay, so here's an interruption. Jesus is Jesus teaching, and boom. Uh, th this, by the way, is the miracle of the four crazy friends. Pray that you've got friends that are crazy enough to do for you what these friends did for the paralyzed man. It was an interruption. What, what about the time Jesus leaves Jericho? He's on his way to the next destination. And on his way, there's some guy in the, in, in the, in the ditch at the side, and he starts yelling, Jesus, Jesus! Blind Bartimaeus. He, he can't see Jesus, but he hears the crowd. He, he asks what's going on. It's Jesus. And he yells, and he interrupts where Jesus is going, and Jesus heals him. My favorite all-time interruption story is when there is an interruption to the interruption. Jesus leaves the boat. I think it's Mark chapter 10. Jesus gets out of the boat. He's on his way somewhere, and on his way to the next destination, along comes a man. He's a Jewish leader named Jairus. He falls on his knees. He's begging Jesus for the life of his daughter. Jesus, would you please come to my house? My daughter is on death's door. If you come, you'll be able to heal her. And Jesus stops where he's going and says, sure, I'll come. And he goes on his way. He's been interrupted by Jairus. He's on his way. And then he gets interrupted again by this lady who's been suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years, lost all of her money by trying to get healed by doctors. Nobody could help her. She was in a worse condition than she was before. She pressed through the crowd, even though she was ceremonially, ceremoniously unclean and shouldn't have been near anyone, knowing if only she could touch Jesus' garment, she'd be healed. And she did, and she was, and Jesus stopped and interchanged conversation with her. Interruption after interruption after interruption. That's what love is. Love is being mindful. I'm not that mindful, so this is what I need to do. And if you're probably cut from the same cloth that I'm cut from, we're also God's kids, and we have the Holy Spirit in us. Don't, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul said, and he is in you, given to you as a gift from God. That's the new covenant promise. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we're his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. He, he'll speak to us if we want to hear and listen. It all comes down to this. To be mindful is to be willing to hear when the Spirit prompts and to let us see what we would never see on our own. As I said, I, I, I can teach you how to look at these crazy hologram things so that you, you can see it. It's, it's not that difficult if you know how to do it, but to be mindful and to see what other people don't see that God puts in front of you, there's no trick to it. It's listening to the promptings of the Spirit and letting God change my heart so that I love like Him. See, only God can change your heart. It's not your willpower. Only God can change your heart. But you are the only one that can let Him. Are you willing? Am I willing? Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, to love like that, 
that requires supernatural love. That, that's the 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. That's the love that flows through us from God. Well, we have a certain amount of love. You know, we're, we're nice people. We're all, well, great people. We, we love. We have the, our own inner source of affection and altruism, and we want to help people. But our, our love generated from ourselves comes to an end. God's love is unconditional. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. And it starts with a prayer. It's not just deciding to do it. It's, it's not mind over matter, none of those things. It's saying, God, I want to love like Jesus. I want to love like that. I want to be aware of the people that are plainly in front of me that I would normally miss. While I was in university, uh, I had a friend in the same program that I was in. Her name was Kathy Mills. One day I'm I'm in the library, and right by the library, there's a sitting area, and there, there's Kathy right there. And uh, just before I take the elevator, I greet her, and, and uh, we, we get into this conversation. Very quickly, turns into a spiritual conversation. And much to my surprise, it's not long, and Kathy surrenders her life to Jesus. She even came out of the church and was baptized. And this is what she told me. Jim... Uh, somehow I knew you were a Christian and I would wait for you in different places because I was wanting you to tell me about Jesus. How often I missed that. I didn't see it. Here's a per this is like this is like your dream come true. A person's waiting for you, wanting you to tell them about Jesus. How often does that happen? Actually, I wonder if it happens more often than we think. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. And then it became so apparent. It was right there. So I, I, I would love to ask you to consider before the Lord to do a few things. The first, if you're not in a small group, can you commit for like five weeks? Uh, talk to one of the pastors email groups at ercf.ca we'll find you in a group or Tuesday nights here at 7.30 there's a group that's going on for sure because circles are better than rows and as you interact and talk and share in that small group setting your faith grows and, and the, the vision that we have is to, is to grow in faith and love and bring hope to our community so that happens as we we receive and share in the practical examples of life. The other thing is to pray. You say, Lord, would you open up my eyes and help me to love like that, where I'm willing to have my agenda interrupted. And when those interruptions come and you feel the frustration <laughs> just starting to rise because you don't have time for this, I'm banking on the Holy Spirit speaking to you and to me. I'm in this. Open your eyes. I'm going to be doing something here. So uh, let, let's pray together. And I, I just want to uh, encourage us all in these next five weeks. Love like that is the resource we're following. And we're learning to apply the love of Jesus in the most practical of ways so that we can truly express the unconditional love of Jesus to everyone. Father, thank you for that love that was so brilliantly displayed at the cross and Jesus in dying for us and not cautiously, but extravagantly, not, not to get something from us, but to give everything of yourself to us. Lord, we can't love like that outside of the power of your Holy Spirit, but we have your Spirit. You're inside of us. You speak to us. Open our hearts and our minds. Prompt us by your Spirit so that we can apply your love and see people around us respond. In Jesus' name.
If you're online following, thank you so much for being here today. And for uh, those that are here, God bless. Have a great week. Be ready for those inspired times of interruption. And let's remember to love like Jesus. You can't do it yourself, but you have God's spirit inside of you. Jesus is in you, and he'll help you. Thank you so much. Have a great week.